Um, so tell me about the song that you wrote, Harley Someday. What inspired you to write that song? Oh, uh, we were doing a, a live uh, album from the Iron Horse Saloon here in Ormond Beach. And uh, I've been uh, doing free concerts at the Iron Horse Saloon for the past 20 years. Uh, appreciation concerts to the fans, um, people that ride motorcycles and so forth. And um, I just uh, had seen over the years a, a change in the in the kind of people that was coming here. And in this particular year, there was a lot of, uh, oh, I guess you call them yuppies, but uh, <laughs> people that were lawyers and and doctors and so forth that that had big fancy motor homes pulling trailers with their motorcycles in it and uh, like weekend bikers, you know. And uh, and I got to thinking about it and I got thinking, you know, come on, David, don't you remember? I started out with a, a Cushman motor scooter and then I got a Wizard motorbike. Yeah. And uh, these, I mean, this is years and years ago, you know. And then I uh, graduated up to a, a little Suzuki and a Honda and, and finally got my first Harley Davidson, you know. And, uh, and, and I think, you know, back in those days, I mean, it was hard to come by Harley Davidson. I mean, you know, for guys like me, you know, poor guys. And... Uh, so, but, but over the years, you have a tendency to forget that, you know, we all started out riding them Hondas and all that stuff, you know, <laughs> and I, I thought, you know, that, that's a funny thing, you know, to, to write a song about that. And, and also, you know, like, from my standpoint, that it was, it was funny, you know, because I see all these people that, well, for an example, when I was, when I recorded for Columbia Records, and when I used to ride my motorcycle, they used to make me park three blocks away. And 10 years later, when I drove by there, there's a sign on the front of the building that says, motorcycle parking only, you know? So all them record executives got motorcycles and it was cool to have a motorcycle yeah. and it was cool to have your parking. But back in the day, you know, they made me park three, three blocks away. You know, they didn't, they didn't want that motorcycle sitting in front of their building, you know? And uh, it got to be fashionable to be a biker all of a sudden. Exactly. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, you know, it's just, uh, and, I, and I think that, uh, I think that the uh, Harley Davidson people uh, started a, an ad campaign a few years ago to try to promote a Harley Davidson motorcycle to a different kind of people. Uh, Harley Davidson motorcycles were pretty much associated with outlaw motorcycle clubs, one percent of motorcycle clubs across the country, uh, in different places, and uh, and 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 I I think that uh, Harley Davidson didn't they didn't like that image, they didn't, and so they started uh, they started uh, shying away from people like me uh, promoting their motorcycles to people that were like movie stars, uh, you know, riding their motorcycles and, uh, and promoting that. And uh, you don't have to be a tough guy to ride a Harley Davidson was one of their, yeah. one of their uh, slogans, you know. And, uh, and, and, and I, I think that it, it worked because uh, a lot of people uh, started uh, uh, riding Harley Davidsons that, Pretty much, I, I think that they were in a big competition with the Honda Red Wing. I think most of those kind of people was really into that that uh, Honda motorcycle, that big Honda motorcycle with the big seats and the radio and yeah, all that. The Gold stuff. Wing. The what now? The Gold Wing. The Gold Wing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, and I think that uh, I, I don't uh, I, I don't have any doubts that 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 uh, that's one of the things that uh, Harley-Davidson was trying to do was uh, not only that, but they were 
they were saying American made, American made, but but in those years Harley Davidson was not American made, and Harley Davidson uh, they had they was having stuff made overseas and and different things, and uh, so you know I just uh, I I remember back that uh, when I was younger, I mean I, I pretty much fix everything on my motorcycle with a pair of pliers and a screwdriver and some <laughs> wire and tape, you know. Yeah. And Jesus, I wouldn't even know where to begin these days on uh, how, to, how to fix something that went wrong or whatever, you know. And I, that's part of what this show is about, you know. They, they charge $80 an hour to change your oil. So oh, we're trying yeah. to teach people how to do basic work on their bikes, you know, because yeah. it's not as hard as it seems but they make it look they make as, it look like it's hard yeah. no it's not it's not that hard they haven't uh, changed that much really no they just, but they make it seem like it is yeah and uh and that's uh that's pretty standard procedure i think for everything but um when you were singing that song i noticed certain people were getting offended when they were as you were describing them as as being wannabes you know yes. and some of them we're kind of feeling like, hey, you know, but then but, the end of the song. But when says, you get to the end and you get that zinger, yeah. it's like the. It's well, like I forget that we all started out just like that. Then they get the picture. Yeah, you know? it's like the punchline of a joke. I, I started out with a, you know, I had a little mini bike. I had a little moped. I used to oh, ride yeah. around on. I had a Honda 750. And when I was younger, I didn't think I'd ever be able to afford a Harley, you know. And but fortunately, I did well enough that I, I went out and bought myself an electric glide. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, man, I've rode that thing all over the country, and I, I swear I don't think I'll ever buy another brand of motorcycle once you get one. And I think that uh, a lot of those those people that are trying to trying to find that lifestyle, you know, the, the trailer guys, you know. I mean, I rode my bike to Daytona and Sturgis all over this country, and, but uh, a lot of these guys, they're not willing to do that yeah they just they, they have their bikes trucked in and they put on their fresh leathers and <laughs> that they wear once a year <laughs> yeah. years ago years ago we used to ride our motorcycles to all of our shows uh i used to ride my motorcycle up on the stage ride yeah. it on the stage and get off and start playing the guitar and uh wow and uh, my partner kid rock put that in his show a couple years ago when we was on tour together he he brought his harley out and rode it up on the stage uh American Badass Tour and uh you know I just um uh, I think that uh, motorcycles have always been a part of rock and roll and rock and roll's always been a part of motorcycles, you know. I mean I just know so many people in the music business that are also into motorcycles, you know. Uh, I myself have tried a lot of different motorcycles uh, over the years and I seem to keep always going back to the same thing when I was younger I just like panhead motorcycles and I just uh, you know I wrote a song called panheads forever and uh, I, to me it was just uh, I just I just felt like I was more in in tune and like just part of the road you know my, my motorcycles were always uh, hard tails that were always could, you know, well, I couldn't do that these days at my age, you know, I couldn't handle that, but, uh, and then, uh, it got to the point where, where we were getting stopped, you know, by the police and they were detaining us and, and, uh, we were missing concerts and it was costing us twenty five, thirty thousand $30,000, you know, a week where we were get, getting stopped and pulled over and being late for a concert or not making the concert, you know, because someone didn't have the right paperwork for their motorcycle or someone didn't have the right this or the right that or, or whatever. And, and we just got to the point where it was just too much and we had to stop doing that, you know. We just had to stop doing it. And then uh, when I got into a uh, filing bankruptcy back years ago and uh, they took all my... Uh, motorcycles except my panhead and I called my friend Billy Stevens who used to own the Iron Horse Saloon when him and Sally was married and and I called Billy and I said you know want, come and get this motorcycle man because they're gonna take it and uh, he still has he still has it to this day there's something about the uh, 
Is it just the look or the sound of the pan head, or is it just because that was part of your era when you got into it? I just I just knew everything about it. I could take it apart blindfolded and put it back together. You know? Yeah. I just knew everything there was about that motorcycle, which to me was important. I mean, you know, when I was out there on the highway, I mean, for the first, I mean, you might find this hard to believe, but when, when I first started in the music business, when I first went to Nashville, I didn't own an automobile. All I had was a motorcycle. And uh, I, uh, that's what I was telling you earlier. Whenever I would ride, they would make me park it down the street. They wouldn't let me park at the record company, <laughs> you know. Uh, but that's all I had. I, did, I had a motorcycle. That was my total form of transportation. I had to ride it in the rain. I had to ride it in the snow. I had. To, I didn't have no other way to get anywhere, you know. <laughs> and uh, in those in those days, you know, it was uh, it was not easy, you know, getting around, you know. And uh, so that that was that was the only form of transportation that I had. And then uh, I got into when I lived in the Key West, you know, and down down in the Keys, I got into the boat, you know, I had the sailboats and, and all that stuff pretty much. And we used to take our motorcycles on the boats and take it take it yeah. with us, you know, when we would sail somewhere and then, you know, we'd have our, our bikes when we got off and uh it was just a way of life, you know, and it was um a free way of life, a free form style, free form lifestyle. It it uh, it, it cost me a lot in the music business because of my lifestyle and because of, um, you know, there's a lot of people that, uh, there was a lot of resistance to my records, a lot of resistance to me, you know, because of my lifestyle. And, um, and that's okay. I mean, that's, that's fine too, you know. Uh, I survived it all and uh, I've made a great living uh, doing what I like to do. I've, uh, I was uh, I was telling uh, my life Kimberly uh, the other day. We were somewhere and uh, walking through a supermarket, and and uh, I picked up this thing of Gojo soap, and I said, "Honey, the first job I ever had in my life was working for the Gojo soap factory for a dollar an hour in Akron, Ohio." And we turned the thing over, and it's still made in Akron, Ohio. Gojo soap hand cleaner for men. And it's it's great stuff, but my job in them days was popping the lids on the cans, and then they went later got the automation, whatever. But but that was the first job I ever had, uh, Go Joe Soap Factory, and 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 all these years when I was working on motorcycles, I always had that Go Joe soap around to clean my hands off with. That was the greatest stuff, degreaser that there was. I don't, you know. We're gonna have to call them up, get them as a. As a sponsor. You, that, you know, it, it's funny you talk about that type of brand loyalty because I've told this story before that, you know, I went to York, Pennsylvania, where they build the oh, uh, well, big twins, you know, times. and I took the tour. And what really made me feel good was I saw bikers that look like you and I building those bikes. That's right. And you know what? Uh, after that, I didn't complain about the cost of them anymore. I said, you know, that's an American biker just like us. He builds that bike, he goes home and spends it on his American family, and uh, I want him to have that money, and I hope he has him a good life because I enjoy my motorcycle and I'm not sending my money someplace else. Yeah. And, um, you know, that means something to me. So when I go shopping for stuff, I, I look at the labels and I want to see where it's from and who made it because I want to know who's getting my money. Yeah. And I, I think that... I think that matters to people. There's not, there's not too much you can get that's made in America anymore. Oh, that's there's, hard, sure. there's not much anything you can, you know. So what little there is, I try to support it, you know. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, I, I've been with the Willie Nelson family for years and years, and, and, and we do farm aid, and we do the Willie Nelson picnics and, and, and all this, and, and, and our family, uh, we always say, buy American buy American. Willie says buy American. I say buy American. You know, uh, support your own people, you know. A lot of people say that's prejudice, but I don't look at it as prejudice. I don't look at it as racism. I just look at it as the reality of the situation is, you know, that just because you can buy something cheaper somewhere else doesn't make it better. 
Oh, yeah. I mean, you know? uh, <laughs> I don't want to get started on that conversation. <laughs> but just because we're saving a few pennies here and there on an extra big box of whatever, it, it yeah. the, the cost as a whole, you know, to uh, Americans is much greater than whatever we're saving. So, you know, uh, I, I was, I, I like to use that Harley uh, synthetic oil. It's, I think it's about eight dollars a quart. And my friend says, oh man, you can get this other oil way cheaper. And I says, why would I want to buy yeah. Saudi Arabian oil? I said, who knows where this oil comes from, but at least Harley's getting a piece of it. You know, at least they're making money off of it and it's in their packaging and, and they get a little something off of it. And the guy at the Harley store gets a little something off it. If I go buy the stuff that comes directly from uh, wherever, Harley ain't getting none of that. So, okay, so it costs me another buck or two. But by supporting that company, they're gonna be around and they're not gonna go through what they went through in the 70s with AMF and it'll keep the product good and it'll keep the, you know, the, the strength of the brand alive and when I want to buy a motorcycle from them I know that it's going to be good. My bike has got 70,000 miles on it. I ain't never had a lick of trouble out of it ever. Ever. But that's and why because you, you do pre-maintenance and you take care, take of, care it. of it. I mean I'm not going to mention the Japanese motorcycle I owned before it but I had 20,000 miles on it and it just fell plumb apart and I couldn't give it away for a quarter of its value and uh, had I taken that same money that I used on that bike and bought a Sportster, I'd have been able to get my full money out of it, pretty much, you know. Yeah. So uh, what my goal is with this show is to teach people that um, buy, buy an American motorcycle or build one yourself. It's not as hard as, as you think to take care of it. And also support people like you who are all part of our community because you are definitely a part of the biker community. Not just, you know, at the concerts you do at the show, but I think um, just part of our culture. And I just wanted to thank you for all the music you've given us over the years and um, who knows what inspiration these bikers have had, maybe singing your songs, driving through the desert on their way to Sturgis. And uh, that means something to me. So that's why you're my friend and that's why I'm here. So. That's cool. I'm glad you're still doing it after all these years, man. I appreciate it. All right. <laughs> I love you, man. Thanks.